Now you can turn over in your Bibles to um, Acts chapter 2, Acts chapter 2. For those of you who are uh, new to our church, you know that um, after you've been here a couple of weeks, we ask you to meet with us, and we want to hear your story of how God's worked in your life, of how God's been gracious to you. We also want to make sure you know who we are as a church, and in sharing those things with you about our church, our desire is that we be modeled after the New Testament church. In the book of Acts, we are studying the early church, and we're looking for the characteristics of the New Testament church. And so far, we've come across four of them. We know that we have a mission. Jesus himself laid it out for us. We are to go into all the world and to make disciples. That is the mission. It's very clear from Scripture. And Jesus even qualified it and said it's also important to recognize that this mission was to start in Jerusalem, and then Judea, and then Samaria, and then spread to the uttermost ends of the earth. And by the way, aren't you thankful that the gospel has spread to the uttermost ends of the earth? I don't know. I don't think we have anybody, anybody here of Jewish descent in our church today. I don't think we have anyone, right? We as Gentiles are thankful that the mission of God is being accomplished and the word is going out to the farthest ends of the earth. So that is the mission. Now with that, there's a couple of things that unify us that we've looked at as far as the characteristics of the New Testament church. One of them is the common confession which centers around the Lord Jesus Christ. You recall that when Jesus asked his disciples, who do you say that I am? Simon Peter on that occasion said to Jesus, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. And believers ever since that time have been echoing that same creed, that same core confession, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. The other thing that unifies us though is an activity and that is prayer. Prayer is what unifies us as believers. It's a priority but it's also a must. We have to pray. Can I get an amen on that? So these are the characteristics so far. We've also added to that the fact that the church has leaders and it has members. The leader ultimately is the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the head of the church. He's in charge. To govern the church ever since the beginning, he gave in the early the formation of the church, the apostles. Um, they passed for the scene, but the ongoing work for the church now to govern the church are elders. We are members of the church. We are members placed there by God. We're part of the bride, part of the bride of Christ. The resources, and this is important, we would often think about resources with time and money, but that's not the resources. It's not brick and mortar or how much money's in the bank. The resource is the Holy Spirit. It is His presence and it is power, and we are thankful for the Holy Spirit to be with us to this day. That brings us today to the message. The message is the gospel. The gospel of God which is, again, all about the Lord Jesus Christ. So I want to ask you to stand with me today as we look at this fifth characteristic of the New Testament church, which is the gospel. And I'd like to read Acts chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. And there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire, and one sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And when the sound occurred, the multitude came together and were confused because everyone heard them speak in his own language. Then they were all amazed and marveled, saying to one another, Look, are not all these who speak Galileans? How is it then that we hear each in our own language in which we were born? Parthenians and Medes, Elamites, those dwelling in Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and parts of Libya, adjoining Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs. We hear them speak in our own tongues the wonderful works of God. So they were all amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, Whatever could this mean? Others, mocking, said, They are full of new wine. But Peter, standing up with the eleven, raised his voice and said to them, Men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and heed my words. For these are not drunk as you suppose, since it's only the third hour of the day. But this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. It shall come to pass in the last days, says God, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, your young men shall see visions, your old men shall dream dreams. And on my men servants and on my maid servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in heaven above, signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood 
before the coming of that great and awesome day of the Lord. And it shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. I'd like to ask Cody James if you would pray at this time, please. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for loving us. Thank you for blessing us. And thank you for sending your son to die on the cross and rise again three days later. I ask that you would be with our pastor. You would give him strength and comfort as he preaches the word. And I ask, Lord, that while we learn about the New Testament church, we would be strengthened and bold and confident in your grace and your love to go forth and continue to proclaim the gospel. Mm -hmm. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. So just by way of reminder, we know that we are talking about the New Testament church, the day of Pentecost in particular, and the work of the Holy Spirit. If you are a Christian then you recognize that the Lord has been at work in your life by way of the Holy Spirit. Everyone who belongs to the Lord, first and foremost, has been regenerated, born again. God has caused you to be spiritually alive. And for that, we are eternally grateful. And by the way, last week, uh, Tim did a great job handling the grace of God and talking about this very thing. When talking about Nicodemus and also John chapter 3 and Ephesians chapter 2, how Nicodemus should have understood then in order to see the kingdom of God, you must be born again. This was already revealed in the Old Testament. If you haven't had a chance to listen to that, take time to listen to his message. But not only that, as Christians, we are indwelt by the Holy Spirit. He is with us. We often think about talking to our children, our grandchildren, to ask Jesus into your heart. But actually, it's the Holy Spirit who resides within us as believers. He also baptized us so that we are now part of the New Testament church. And there are times, praise the Lord, when we are yielded, and therefore, we are filled with the Holy Spirit. We are controlled by the Spirit. And by the way, that's what we desire as believers, isn't it? Not to be governed by our flesh and by our selfishness, but rather to be governed by the Holy Spirit. Scripture is also clear. Each and every one of us has one spiritual gift at least. Some have more, but we don't have the same spiritual gifts. When we look at the day of Pentecost, it's important to note that all those Jews who were gathered in Jerusalem, they heard the message in their own tongue, in their own dialect, in their own language, and they were added by the Holy Spirit, baptized them into the New Testament church, some 3,000 of them on that particular day. Now, as we go through Acts, as I mentioned a couple of weeks ago, we want to pay particular attention to the words that Luke uses. He will use the word outpour or outpouring very specifically for the manifestation of the Holy Spirit. He'll talk about being baptized by the Spirit, which is not the same as the outpouring, but rather that means you are placed into the New Testament church. Then we'll also notice over and over again, people who are full of the Spirit are filled with the Spirit as we go through the book of Acts. Simon Peter's sermon on that particular day began in verse 14. If you look at the text, you'll notice that he began with a clarification. You're worried about what's going on here on this day? Some of you think these people are drunken. That's not it. They have not had time yet to be drunk. It's the third hour of the day. It's 9 o'clock in the morning, so that's not what's going on. Rather, this is an expression of Joel chapter 2, the outpouring of the Spirit that Joel spoke about. This is a manifestation of the Spirit. There is dual fulfillment here. Not everything took place that Joel talked about there on the day of Pentecost. There's still more to come. Pentecost was just a sample. And we notice that there's coming a future day of the Lord. Look at verse 19 there again. I will show wonders in heaven above and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. Now, believers, aren't we looking forward to that day? The events associated with don't sound too good, but we pray, even so, come Lord Jesus. That song that we sang, mine are days, filled with who knows what, but what the Lord has given to us is an eternal hope. The Lord will return, and we will be with him forevermore. But there is the need to call upon the Lord. This is not universal salvation that everybody and all dogs lead to heaven, right? Or all dogs go to heaven. I think that's the theology, right? There is the need to call upon the Lord. Look at verse 21 again. And it shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now, I'm going to bring this up again, I think, next week. There are several erroneous things that can develop from Acts chapter 2 that I think I want to spend some time clarifying. But for today, I want to at least uh, take a moment to consider something that we see in this particular verse that I think is significant. What you see in this particular verse, in verse 21, is what's called the gospel call or the universal call. When you present the gospel, 
you tell people that there is something they need to do, namely to repent of sin and trust in Jesus Christ. Or if you want to put it this way, you need to call upon the Lord. That is the universal call. That is the gospel call. And when presenting the gospel, that needs to take place. However, there is a work of God that is around that, that is underneath it, that encompasses it, that is necessary for you to call upon the Lord. And that is called the effectual call of God. Now, the effectual call of God is when God speaks to those who are spiritually dead, and he calls them to himself, giving them life, again, the Holy Spirit regenerating, causing them to be born again. And no one will call upon the Lord until the Lord calls to that individual and changes them from those who are enemies of God, making them friends of God. So there is the universal call, the gospel call that is presented when the gospel is out there. Call upon the Lord, repent of sins, trust in Christ. But no one can do it until the Lord himself calls that individual. Now that's actually in our text, and I want you to see that today. But you won't see it at first, so first of all we have to go back to what he's quoting. Okay, So go back to Joel chapter 2. Joel chapter 2, and maybe this might help. Say, Pastor Steve, can you illustrate what you're talking about? Do you remember when Jesus stood before a tomb and he said three words, Lazarus, come forth. Do you remember those words? That is an example of the effectual call of God. Lazarus was dead. He was unable to fulfill that commandment of God. But Jesus' call was effectual, not only telling him what he needed to do, but giving him the ability to do that. Anybody else would have stood outside that tomb, said the same words, Lazarus, come forth. That would have been a gospel call, but it wouldn't have been effectual because that individual would not have the power to bring him forth. So there's the necessity to proclaim the gospel, call people to repentance, but God must call the individual to change them. So look at Joel now, Joel chapter 2. I want you to notice that Simon Peter is clearly quoting here, verse 28. I'm in Joel 28. It shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. So you see he's quoting that. He's quoting that from Joel chapter 2. Now go down to verse 32. And here it is, what we just read in Acts. And it shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. There's the gospel call. There's the universal call to do something. But now notice the second part of the verse that is not quoted in Acts, at least in verse 21, but notice the second part of verse 32 here. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem there shall be deliverance, as the Lord has said, among the remnant whom the Lord calls. So do you see that? We have the universal call. Whoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. But the effectual call of God, the remnant that God must call. Now, go back to Acts. I want you to see this in Acts. In Acts chapter 2. Again, verse 21. We see the first part of Joel 2.32. It shall come to pass whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. You might say, wait a second, Pastor Steve. Where's the second part of that verse from Joel? Go down. Go down to verse 38. And notice Simon Peter, as he's concluding his sermon, here's what he says. And Peter said to them, here's the gospel call, repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So there again, the gospel call, repent. Now look at verse 39. For the promise is to you and to your children and to all who are far off, and here it is, as many as the Lord our God will call. The gospel call goes out, the universal call goes out, but it's not effectual unless God does the work of calling the individual. Keep in mind, in the midst of repentance, the call to believe, we're reminded that all of that is dependent upon God. When you witness, when you pronounce the gospel, you give the gospel call, you give the universal call, but you trust in God to do that unseen work of taking out that heart of stone and giving that individual heart which beats and pants after him. And one of the reasons I want to talk about this next week is because there is no question that children who are raised in a Christian home are blessed. That right there in and of itself is a blessing to all children to have at least one parent who is a believer. But that does not guarantee salvation for anyone. 
there is still the need for God to call that individual. With that being said, for those who respond to the gospel, we rejoice, don't we? I mean, what a privilege and what a blessing, what a great opportunity to share the gospel and see someone like they, they go from being dead to alive, their eyes light up and they get it. And they trust in Jesus Christ. We rejoice in God because it's His good work. For those who don't respond, we continue to witness, but ultimately we have to pray because God must do the work. And we trust God because God is able to save and God still does save to this day. And sometimes you might think they're too far gone. You keep praying. And what a blessing to see older individuals who have maybe even started out in church, maybe in a Christian home, but didn't serve the Lord. And then in those final days, in that final week, maybe even their final breath, they trust in Jesus Christ. And we are reminded that there was one who we know for certain that did, the thief on the cross. So we continue to pray until that very final day. Now that brings me now to the message that Simon Peter proclaimed that day, and it was the gospel. Did you notice in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 how Paul defined the simplicity of the gospel? If you need to, you can go back and check, but he said, I delivered unto you what was first given to me from the Lord, how that, number one, he died according to the Scripture. Number two, he was buried, but he rose again according to the Scripture. And then he made these appearances to so many different individuals, to Peter and to James, and finally even to me, the least of all the... Oh, and by the way, on one occasion, over 500 people. So when you look at the Gospel in 1 Corinthians 15, part of the message must be the death, burial, resurrection and the appearances of Jesus Christ to verify it. Now with that being said, here in Acts chapter 2, I want you to see the outline of Simon Peter for his sermon. He first of all focuses on Jesus, then he'll focus on the Christ, and then he'll focus on the fact that he is the Lord. So Jesus Christ, the Lord, and over and over again, focusing on his death, burial, and resurrection, and then his ascension and exaltation. So let's look at how Simon Peter's sermon develops on this day. It's not a very long sermon. They'd be in and out less than 30 minutes, I think, on this day. But God was at work, right? So first of all, the focus on Jesus, picking it up in verse 22 here of Acts. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God, to you by, miracul by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did through him in your midst, as you yourself also know. Him being delivered by the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God, you have taken by lawless hands, have crucified and put to death, whom God raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it is not possible that he should be held by it. For David says concerning him, I foresaw the Lord always before my face, and this is Psalm 16, for he is at my right hand, that I may not be shaken. Therefore my heart rejoiced and my tongue was glad. Moreover, my flesh also will rest in hope. For you will not leave my soul in Hades, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. You have made known to me the ways of life. You will make me full of joy in your presence. So Simon Peter says we're considering the man. But it's not just any man, it is the man, the God-man. And God verified who he was through signs, wonders, and miracles. And at the same time, we see that God had a plan. His sovereign plan, his predetermined purpose and plan was that Jesus should suffer and die. And I feel like maybe we should just stop and think about that for a moment. Because of our sin, God the Father determined that his son should die in our place. If that doesn't grip us, I don't know what will. That we are undeserving but God, rich in mercy and grace, with the great love with which he loved us, even when we were still dead, not only sent his son, but made us alive. And yet we see the idea of dual agency here. It was God's purpose, it was God's plan, but it was carried out by wicked individuals. The most horrific event in history, the death of Jesus Christ, dual agency, the purpose and the plan of God, carried out by sinful men. And I often think, if we were there, we would have been in line with a hammer to pound the, the nails into his hands. But as much as there is a crucifixion day, there is coming a resurrection day. And Easter will be here really soon on our calendar, and we'll celebrate that Jesus Christ, the man of Nazareth, rose from the dead. And this was announced prior by David. You recall a chapter 1 and verse 16 of Acts, 
This was under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, so the Holy Spirit was active in the Old Testament. And he announced not about himself, but about the coming Messiah that he would rise from the dead. Now, we're going to shift from Jesus to Christ, but we're not going to shift away from the resurrection. So now verses 29 through 31, speaking now about the Christ. Men and brethren, let me speak freely to you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. Therefore, being a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that of the fruit of his body, according to the flesh, he would raise up the Christ to sit on the throne. He, foreseeing this, spoke concerning the resurrection of the Christ, that his soul was not left in Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. Now, Simon Peter here is saying that God had made a commitment. There was an oath. He swore. And you recall that the writer of Hebrews says, that when you swear, you always swear by the one higher than yourself. But there's a dilemma for God. There's no one higher than God, so God swears by himself. And there are two immutable things in which it is impossible for God to lie. And so there's a commitment, there's a covenant made that his son, the Messiah, would rise from the dead. Now, for those of you who like to think about uh, apologetics, Simon Peter is going to present here his argument for the evidence of the resurrection. He's going to say basically four things. Number one, David's tomb. You remember that? By the way, it's down the road over there. We know where it is. And it's occupied. So when David was talking about rising from the dead, he wasn't ultimately talking about himself, but about Jesus Christ. Number two, there's a bunch of people here today. You've heard them speaking in tongues in foreign languages. This is a manifestation of the Spirit. And these are individuals who saw Jesus risen from the dead. Over 500 saw him on one occasion. Then Simon Peter says, not only that, but what you're seeing today is an outpouring of the Spirit. The fact that these individuals are able to communicate is the, nothing less than the power and the presence of God that you would hear in your own language. And finally, he'll mention his ascension, that Jesus not only rose from the dead, but he ascended on high. And this is a fulfillment of Psalm 110. I will make your enemies your footstool until he's there until the end times and Jesus is at the right hand of the Father. So finally, Simon Peter says, let me give you the doctrine. This Jesus is both Lord and Christ. Jesus is not just a man. He is not just the Messiah who died for others. He is the Lord God Almighty. So look now at this next portion of his sermon here, focusing again on the fact that Christ rose from the dead. He appeared. He's ascended. He's exalted. And this is established by God. God made him both Lord and Christ, verse 32 and following. This Jesus God has raised up, of which we are all witnesses, therefore being exalted at the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he poured out this which you now see and hear. For David did not ascend into the heavens, but he says himself, the Lord said to my Lord, Psalm 110, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. Simon Peter doesn't pull any punches. You're the ones who did it. You crucified him. But God the Father has made him both Lord and Christ. Which is wonky, isn't it? What does it mean that he made him Lord and Christ? That's not, that doesn't sound right, does it? We're not talking here about something new. We're talking about the eternal generation of the second member of the Godhead, the Son, whom the Lord has indicated is indeed both Lord and Christ. I was trying to think of an easy way to illustrate this. Um, I thought about two different things. How many of you ever received an inheritance? Anybody here like that? If you did, that inheritance was established before you received it. It was a reality that was manifest or realized at some time. The other illustration I came up with is um, I think over in Great Britain, I think they still have a king and a queen over there, right? But if you notice, they're always talking about the next ones, right? Who's next in line? The heirs to the throne. They already are heirs. It's just not yet been manifest, but it's a reality that exists, and at time, it will be manifest. That's the idea here. Jesus Christ is the second member. He is the Son of God. He is the Messiah. He, he was slain before the foundation of the world. He's the Lord God Almighty. Just a matter of it being manifest for all to see. Last thing I want to mention here before I get to the crowd's response is do notice the Godhead in this passage. We've been noticing so many things. The God the Father determined this. This was pre-planned. 
God didn't come up and say, oh, no, we got a problem. People have sinned. What are we going to do? It was established before the foundation of the world, his plan, his purpose. So even, as I mentioned, that the son might be considered slain before the foundation of the world. This was according to his perfect foreknowledge that Jesus would suffer and die. And this is the God who sits on the throne and besides him now sits the son of God in all of his glory, his beloved son, heir, who, by the way, willingly laid down his life for us. No man could take it from him, but he did this for us. The Holy Spirit who empowered Jesus to perform miracles while he was here on earth, signs and wonders, and all this manifestation of the Holy Spirit there on the day of Pentecost, some 3,000 Jews believe they heard in their own language, in their own dialect, they trusted in Jesus. In order to get there, though, we have the response of the crowd. So look at verse 37 now at the end of the sermon. This would be great. I wish this would happen every Sunday, right? Now, when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? This is an indication of the work of the Spirit. Without the Spirit, there can be no conviction of sin. There would be no recognition that there needs to be something done. Um, we're doing okay on time. Let's go to John chapter 15. John chapter 15. Just by way of reminder that this is indeed the work of the Spirit. You and I are not smart enough to figure it out on our own, and we are not clever enough to convince anyone. The Holy Spirit must be at work. So John 15, go to the end of the chapter. John 15, the end of the chapter. Look at 26. Jesus, if you recall, in John 14, says that he's going to prepare a place for them. Um, and he, where he goes, they're going to be able to come as well. And they're concerned, where are you going? What's going on? He says, well, I'm getting ready to go, but in the meantime, I will send the Helper. And this is what he says in 26. But when the Helper comes, that's the Holy Spirit, whom I shall send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will testify of me. And you also will bear witness because you have been with me from the beginning. Now go down to chapter 16, verse 8. And when he comes, that's speaking about the Holy Spirit, he will convict the world of sin of and of righteousness and of judgment of sin because they do not believe in me and of righteousness because I go to my father and you see me no more of judgment because the ruler of this world will be judged. It's that same spirit on the day of Pentecost that convicted sin and righteousness and judgment that does it to this day. And we pray that he would as we present the gospel. Let's go back to Acts now. And Simon Peter then issues once again the gospel call, the universal call, the need to repent. Picking up again in Acts chapter 2, verse 38. Then Simon Peter said to them, Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promises to you and to your children, to all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God will call. And with many other words he testified and exhorted them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. And again, praise the Lord. People did get saved that day. People did get saved. Some still rejected. Perhaps they got saved later, but the Lord was at work. Now, by way of conclusion, I have lots of different thoughts, but let me try and focus in on just a few things. The mission of the church is to go and make disciples. And part of that process is to share the gospel. And we are still called by the Lord to present the gospel at every opportunity that we have when the Spirit indicates we should speak. We know from our th a passage in Acts chapter 3, verse 19 for this year, the times of refreshing come from the presence of the Lord. And as a Christian, you know what I'm talking about. In the midst of the daily life that we encounter, the struggles, the ups and the downs, the goods and the, the hard things, how sweet it is to just draw aside, spend time with the Lord and be refreshed. But you recall there's a requirement in that particular verse. It says, repent. Repent, therefore, that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. So there's the necessity to repent of sin. When you are presenting the gospel, you want to present the fact that Jesus Christ died for our sins. Present the fact that he was indeed buried, but he rose again in order to justify us that we might be right with God. Tell people that he was seen by countless individuals say that he's sitting on the throne and he's coming again, but always put a heavy focus on his resurrection, that Christ rose from the dead. If Jesus Christ is not risen, then our faith is what? It is in vain. 
no matter what people say, as you're witnessing to them, take them over and over again back to the fact that Jesus Christ rose from the dead. I, I cannot tell you the number of times that I have been with individuals, and some of them has been really interesting. I have had individuals who want to tell me, I don't believe that there's a God. I don't believe in this Bible stuff. I don't think there's any reason to pray about anything. And I've had people justify all kinds of sin as it relates to their life, unbelievers, over and over again. And I would always say to them, that's all interesting. I'm, I might want to know more about that. But what are you going to do with the fact that Jesus Christ rose from the dead? I'm thinking of one individual in particular right now that that was the story. He was going on and on justifying his sin. And I barely knew the man. And I said to him, okay, what are you going to do with the fact that Jesus Christ rose from the dead? And he looked at me like I had lost my mind. Have you not been listening to what I've been telling you? How I am right in all that I do, no matter how wrong I am. And I would say again, <laughs> what are you going to do with the fact that Jesus Christ rose from the dead? About a week later, that individual called me and said, I believe in Jesus Christ. And began a wonderful journey, a wonderful relationship in seeing how God grew that individual in the faith. I remember years ago, um, a gentleman that was dragged to church by his wife one Easter morning in 1997. He walked in as an unbeliever and he heard the message that Jesus Christ rose from the dead. No other religious leader can boast such a thing but Christ and Christ alone. He walked out a different man. And for a good portion of the rest of his life, every other Thursday, early on, I would get together with him and disciple him. No matter what someone's saying about their life, no matter what they say about God, always take them back to Jesus Christ rose from the dead. It might seem like it doesn't even fit in the conversation. It always fits in the conversation. Make sure that they are confronted with that truth, that Christ and Christ alone rose from that. He's the only Savior. The only one, the, there's no other name given under heaven whereby we must be saved other than Jesus Christ. The other thing I want to point out to you in sharing the gospel, make sure you tell your story as well, what God has done for you. Can I point that out to you in this passage? Look at verse 32 again. There's little things that I think oftentimes we overlook. Simon Peter says, this Jesus, has, uh, this, this Jesus God has raised, wait a minute, this Jesus God has raised up, and here it is, of which we are all witnesses. So Simon Peter says, I have a story to tell. I saw Jesus Christ risen from the dead, and you have a story to tell as well. And I would tell you that the sweetest testimony is your testimony of God's grace. I, I would almost be curious, it might be interesting to find out sometime. I can, well, let's do it in a benign way. How many of you were saved later in life, not as a, a young child? So that means for those of you here, no doubt you probably lived enough life to know that you were pretty bad sinners. Can I get an amen on that? Make, make it soft if you have to, okay? <laughs> but you are aware of your lost estate, and your story is a great story to tell, now, sometimes, though, people want to compete, right? Um, you know, I did this. I stole a slingshot when I was a kid. Oh, not me. I was involved in blah, 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 right? I was a drunk or whatever. It's not a competition because all of us begin in the same position, unworthy, but God, rich in mercy and grace. So don't feel like you have to outdo some other testimony. Just tell your testimony what God's done in your life. And I would say for those of you who are saved early on and you have a hard time remembering when you weren't a believer, that's a sweet testimony. And don't shy away from telling that one either. You don't have to say it's grand and, you know, I was some hatchet murderer or whatever. You don't have to do that. It is enough that you were dead in sins and you were an enemy of God. But God, tell your story. And you say, but I've never seen Jesus risen from the dead. Let me tell you something. It's as if you have. Because you are more blessed those who have not seen and yet believe. So you tell your story of God's grace and you share the gospel. At the same time, I do want to remind you, it's an okay thing to tell people, not only to issue that universal gospel call that they need to repent of sin and trust in Jesus Christ, it's an okay thing to tell them, guess what, you cannot do it unless God is at work in your life. You might think, wait a minute, should I tell somebody that in witnessing? Would that give them an excuse not to believe? Do you know what, when God works, it's not going to make a bit of difference? When God changes your heart, you have to cry out, Abba, Father. 
But for us to recognize our helpless estate, our sinful estate, is not a bad thing for us in God's economy. And part of the reason we want to continue to declare that truth is because in the end, it is God and God alone who gets the glory. None of us, none of us, will be able to stand before holy God and say, God, <laughs> I'm pretty clever. <laughs> I figured this thing out. And the more I think about it, the more, the more I'm convinced, I'll say, God, even though I know the truth and I know your son died for me, I'm not worthy. And if you were to cast me from your presence right now, I'd have... I couldn't, I couldn't mount an argument because I know I'm undeserving. And by the way, folks, in sharing the gospel, don't think for a moment that you're going to be smart enough or clever enough or reasonable enough to convince anybody else. The blinders are there. And I know that there are probably times you get so frustrated with the individual, the truth is right before you. Why can't you see it? But folks, when we live in a world where people don't even acknowledge what they actually do see with their eyes, something as simple as gender, should we be amazed that the God of this world has darkened them and put on those blinders in their dead estate they cannot see? Whom the Son sets free is free indeed. And it is only the work of God. And all the glory and all the credit must go to Him, not to us. And I'm going to close out by just noting that in this passage. At the end, after we see how these early believers lived out their life, we're reminded of the statement that it is the work of God and not the work of man. Look at verses 46 and 47. So continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favor with all people. And here's the statement I want you to see. And the Lord... The Lord added to the church daily those who are being saved. Father, we do recognize today from your word that we, unless you build a house, we're going to labor in vain. And you are the God of salvation, and you alone are the one who can change the hearts of individuals. Lord, I pray that you would keep us from being impatient with individuals that we love when we're seeking to share with them the truth, and yet they're rejecting it. Please, Lord, give us patience to understand that they're unable to come to you unless you do a work. And then, Lord, please cause us over and over again to be people who go to you in prayer, who recognize that you must indeed. We want to be found faithful, Lord. We want to be committed to what you've told us to do to present the gospel and call people to repent and trust in your Son. But, Lord, cause us to be a people on our knees. Where, where a true deep love for others would be demonstrated. That we know that they are with, they're, they're unable and that we, are, <laughs> we just don't have it within us to fix the problem. Help us to be found in prayer, I pray. And Lord, for those here today who do know you, we just want to say thank you. Thank you for saving us. Thank you that At the right time, you sent someone to declare the truth to us. But thank you that in what is unseen, you gave us the ability to hear and to respond. And Lord, if there is someone here today who doesn't know you, I pray, Lord, that they would have ears to hear today, that you might grant them that understanding to hear your message, to hear your still, small voice. Today would be the day of salvation that they would repent of sin and trust in your Son, Jesus Christ, the Lord. It's in his name I pray. Amen.